All right. I decided to mix it up a little bit today. Kyle has served me as a wonderful conversation partner in this class. Kyle, as you know, is our new director of our preschool and principal of our school and uh, taught within the uh, virtue tradition for many years. Uh, did his, uh, did his um, graduate studies at Fuller Seminary in a degree in philosophical theology. And uh, he and I have met every week uh, after and through this class, and he's taken copious notes and has been really helpful to me as an interlocutor uh, to, uh, to think through uh, the curriculum and, uh, and how best to, to make the, the, the minor adjustments to help you all in what we're talking about. And so uh, I had just a great conversation with Kyle this week, and we were doing uh, philosophy and theology in real time uh, in my office and in his office. And um, I thought, you know, it might not be a bad thing for the congregation to be a part of that and to be witness to how philosophy and how theology gets done. And so uh, Kyle and I put together a, a list of subjects that we want to talk about together and with you as we continue in our growth and our understanding of um, of uh, virtue. And to begin that, actually we're going to begin with prayer, and then if you have your booklets, I want to ask you to turn to section 4, chapter 4, the end of virtue. All right, we're going to get to this uh, in just a second, but let me begin by praying. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for the privilege to study, to grow in our knowledge of you, to grow in our understanding of what it means to be virtuous men and women, a life that you've called us to, that you've designed us for, and it's not a small or incidental thing to uh, come to an understanding of virtue and how to acquire it and how to uh, be trained in it and by it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless our understanding today as we continue to grow and as we continue to seek to bring you glory as we uh, enter into the fullness of all who we are supposed to be uh, as we enter into the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, a couple things um, just to kind of get us started. One of the questions that, um, that Kyle and I were talking about this week was a basic one, but nobody ever asked it. Uh, oops. What is a body for? What is a body for? Why did God give us bodies? If you look at uh, chapter 4 of The End of Virtue, I want to read to you a quote from Dr. Byron Batar, who was my mentor in uh, philosophical theology. Uh, both Kyle and I studied under him. And this is something that uh, Dr. Batar wrote. He said, The end of Christ's ministry was not and is not that humans be forgiven of their sins. Let's just stop there, <laughs> okay? And let me, let me re-read that statement. The end of Christ's ministry was not and is not that humans be forgiven of their sins. That's, a, that's an incredible thing to say because I think I can speak for all of us. That's our, that's our working assumption. Christ came to die for our sins so that we can be set free from sin and death and we can enjoy eternal life. But Batar says, the end of Christ's ministry was not and is not that humans be forgiven of their sin. He goes on to say, it would be a nightmare to forgive humans and leave them with immoral character. It'd be one thing if you were set free from sin, but you were living, you were in an eternal living death. There's a reason why God put at the entrance to the Garden of Eden an angel with a giant flaming sword so that we could no longer gain access to the tree of life. Otherwise, we would be in a perpetual state of doom, death, walking death. Forgiveness was and is only a means. The end is the transformation of bad character to good character. 
the nurture of, of moral virtues in the lives of humans, the perfection of human powers and abilities in holy habits and skills. The ultimate bond with God is good character, the love of holiness in God, self and others. In the end, there is no friendship with God, no intimacy with God without holy character. In the end, there is no place in the kingdom of God for people of evil character. Virtue is absolutely crucial to a Christian life since it is the end, in a sense, of salvation. It is what God wants in and from humans. God is glorified by us primarily as we become perfected by growing in God's virtue and holiness in our primary and everlasting bond with God and each other. So when I started to recognize that and understand that for the first time, that was a total game changer, paradigm buster. I always thought that Christ died just so I could be forgiven. And Batar basically blows that up and says, no, that's not why Christ died. And so that led to a conversation that Kyle and I were having earlier this week about, and the way that you framed it was, what is a body for? That is to say, if God has made us, He has created us with bodies, with hands, with feet, heads, all the parts that come with the body, what is the point? And you had some very... Uh, according to you. According to me. I, well, I enjoy talking with you, Kyle. Yeah. What do you think is the point of having a body? What is salvation for? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, well, let me preface it with this. In the virtue and vice tradition, the first, conver- the, the first question that always comes up is, you know, you have some component or some part, like a mind, and then you start talking about intellectual virtues, What's the purpose of an intellect? Is it to understand something? Is it to be confused? And already we know where that's going and we know the right answer to that. To have a mind is to not be confused. It's to understand something. And so then you start talking about virtues or excellences. That word virtue means excellence. What are the excellences that you need or the skills that you need in order to understand? in order for your mind to function the way it's supposed to function. We would say, I would say, that that's how God designed it. Uh, So virtue is really tapping into what is that something, what's it for, and why did God design it that way? So on the one side of the virtue and vice tradition, you have a conversation about the mind. What is a mind for? What are into, and what are the intellectual virtues that help the mind do what it's supposed to do? And on the other side are moral virtues, and those tap into the body. What's a body for? What are you supposed to do with a body? And how is it designed? And what are the skills and the excellences that help you use the body in the way that it's been designed to be used? So at the root of all, all discussion of virtue and vice... Is, this, is the assumption or the investigation of what is that thing for and what makes it do what it's supposed to do really well. Yeah, I think you and I came from a similar background in that we came to Geneva College not from the Reformed tradition. And, and this, this really, I think, is helpful for syncing up the virtue tradition with the Reformed tradition. Of course, the virtue tradition precedes the Reformed tradition. It's actually best maintained within the Roman Catholic tradition, but it actually has an important place within the Reformed tradition. And you and I, we didn't come, you were CMA background, church planner, uh, I want to say also Calvary, Calvary Chapel. I was raised in the charismatic world, um, vineyard Christian fellowship. The, The idea of salvation was forgiveness of sin, and and then maybe we would talk a little bit about heaven. Maybe, maybe, uh, but there was that was an abstraction. We never really talked about what heaven was all about. It wasn't until I came into the Reformed tradition that there was the in, the introduction of or the inclusion of the new heavens and the new earth. Mm-hmm. And so, what the Reformed tradition was was italicizing biblically is that we are Christ died and Christ rose in or, as the first fruit of the resurrection of the body for us. And so our embodiment, 
what it means to be a human and what it means to be a Christian includes bodies Mm -hmm. now and eternally. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to do something with our bodies. Mm -hmm. We're not just going to float around like angels, Mm -hmm. right? And harps and, and, and we're not just going to, it's not going to be a 24 seven worship service like we're having up here. That would, or playing basketball the entire time, which is what right, right. I thought heaven was going to be like. You thought of basketball. Let's <laughs> yeah. play basketball all yeah. the time. I heard a, a guy at a youth retreat once say that heaven was going to be bow hunting for bucks. <laughs> that was his whole conception. And then he'd shoot a deer, and the deer would pull out the arrow and say, nice shot. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those are romanticized understandings of what heaven is. But there's a new heavens and a new earth, and there's going to be a created order. Mm-hmm. And we are called to live in that created order, embodied, Mm -hmm. and to do things excellently. Mm -hmm. And so virtue is important now, and it also has an eternal consequence. Mm -hmm. We are called to to develop those virtues and those skills now, and they will continue. Your conscience, your soul, is the only thing that um, that, uh, 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 continues after your death. I'm trying to think of the actual theological term for it. It's escaping me. But your conscience continues after death. We don't hold to annihilationism mm-hmm. where in death you're obliterated and you're not, you're not remembered. God retains your personality. He retains your character. Mm-hmm. He reca- retains your person. And what you bring into eternity, mm-hmm. you're bringing what you, skills and habits and virtues you develop now into eternity in order to engage and to perfect them uh, uh, eternally, which is why when we went to Geneva, the first conception I ever had of the liberal arts tradition, you can't make sense of liberal arts without virtue, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How does liberal arts and virtue work together? Well, I think... I have a couple of responses to something you just said. All the things. We're doing philosophy together. We'll jump back here in a second. But, um, I mean, I think that's, that's... at least historically been the purpose of the liberal arts to to give you uh, different perspectives and think deeply about principles in order that you can uh, cultivate virtue. Uh, so if you know if an intellectual virtue is understanding, then you engage in five different worldviews through the through the liberal arts which help you come to understand what, what am I doing here? What's yeah. this world for? Yeah. Um, why, you know, why are we just stumbling through life for 80 years? Right. Uh, you know, what are we supposed to be doing? And the liberal arts are meant to be disciplines that help you think about mm-hmm. those sorts of questions and come to live a good life, mm-hmm. to live an excellent life, and to do what you're supposed to do. Can I jump back now? Please, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for me, two concepts in the Reformed tradition that were eye-opening to me were this word transformation mm-hmm. and glorification. Mm-hmm. Um, transformation was paradigm shifting for me because I sort of looked at salvation and the Christian life and discipleship as some kind of arrival, mm. arriving at something. Like once you're saved, that's where you're supposed to be. But within the Reformed tradition, this concept of transformation is everything is a renewal. Mm -hmm. Everything is a restoration back to uh, God's original intent for how the world should work and how you should be a creature Mm -hmm. in the world. And we can get to that later. I love the word creature. We sing it in the doxology, and it's such a rich word, but for many of us, it seems like a weak word. Mm. I don't want to be a creature. At best, I want to be something rational and godlike and divine. But um, being a creature is, is what we're called to be, a certain kind of creature. Right. And so you and I were really energized this week by going back to the tradition and remembering uh, a quote by uh, Irenaeus, who was an early church father. And Irenaeus famously said, uh, he kind of gave a summary statement of what is, the, what is salvation for? What does it mean? What is a body for? He said, um, the glory of God is, the glory of God is a human being 
fully alive. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. So it's not just saved with a weak character, a, a weak form of life that goes on in per perpetuity, but a, the glory of God is being saved and then being nurtured towards our perfection in order that we might be transformed, in order that we might be the creature that God called us to be. And that creatureliness has a glory, mm -hmm. and it reflects the glory of God. It brings God glory when we are acting out of the fullness of who we're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And virtue is something that God has called us to, to get there. Mm -hmm. Without virtue, we can't get there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen at our conversion, and then the Holy Spirit descends on us and we go, oh, it's... And then it's over. And then it's over, right. Yeah. Conversion is a doorway to a life of discipline and a life of, of excellence where things are being shaped and honed over and over and over again. And so you have in our, our handout for this morning, it's about more than us. It's about wholeness and integration of the created order, not, not merely being a nice person or a successful individual. Why don't you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so I think sometimes in, when we talk about virtues, they, they are individualized. I don't want to say individualistic because that's the very thing that we should resist. It's not just about me being virtuous. It's about me being a virtuous person so that the rest of creation can be excellent. Right. Um, so there's a... Kind of like being on a team, right? <laughs> you know, and knowing your role and, knowing your and role. doing your job. Doing your job. Uh, and winning. <laughs> winning the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there, you know, there's a, there's a cosmic dimension to it. Um, you know, studying, if understanding is, is an intellectual virtue, there is a social and cosmic dimension to understanding. That, that we could think about. If I really study things and then I share them with you and I've understood them and I've understood them the way that they should be understood, by becoming virtuous in that way, I'm also benefiting you, helping you yep. to understand. Or if I become a just person, which is justice is one of the moral virtues that philosophers and theologians talk about. Obviously, we know that if I'm a just person, it's going to be good for you. Um, so within, within the virtue and vice tradition, there's always a social neighborly aspect to it. That uh, in, a, in so much as I become a virtuous person, I will rub off on you. Right. Um, and I think we have to think about the virtue and vice tradition in that way. That if I'm going to be a vicious person, it's going to be bad for you. And it's going to be bad for the land and in the environment uh, and it's going to be bad for God, you know. It's not going to glorify God, right? But, but if I'm a virtuous person, yep. you know, I'm shaping the world and arranging the world in, in the way that God designed it to be, mm -hmm. and thereby I'm glorifying God and loving my neighbor. Ken Myers, who's the president of uh, Mars Hill Audio Journal, it's a resource that I've listened to for getting close to 15 years now, uh, Ken Myers is the president and the uh, chief editor in chief of that of that ministry, and he was talking about this tradition, the, the virtue tradition, and this rubbing off idea because he sings in choirs, and he made an interesting observation which I've, uh, I'll never forget. He said, "I think he sings tenor." He says, "When other people are singing their parts really well, when the sopranos are singing their part, and the altos and the basses are singing their part." When they're singing that with excellence, it actually helps him to be a better tenor. Mm -hmm. When you hear people going off pitch and going in different places, or if Tom's sitting next to you and he's doing what he's doing, you know, it can get a little sketchy. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if Kevin's here. I would have thrown him under the bus. He's always sitting next to me when I sing. So it's important to sing. When you sing well, you sing your part with excellence, mm -hmm. power, in strength, the other person standing next to you can you can rub off on them. Mm -hmm. Not only will they be able to sing their part, they'll they may also be encouraged, challenged, and encouraged to to match, mm -hmm. match pitch, mm -hmm. to match what's going on, so that um, there is this 
transformation within community, not just an individual. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's about wholeness, it's about integration of the created order, not merely being a nice person or a successful individual, but being excellent, mm -hmm. and excellent within community. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else you wanted to add to this? Is it all right that uh, Kyle calls this nerding out? I enjoy yeah, nerding. We're nerding out. We're nerding out. <laughs> I love that. Um, you said here, we're already doing them or not doing them. Virtues yeah. are not add-ons to our lifestyle or an extra thing to do. We're always either behaving virtuously or viciously. Yeah. Can I plug my book? Too? Yes, please do that. Since you plugged it already. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, one, one, one part of my doctoral work was in spiritual disciplines. And essentially what I, I had one agenda for studying spiritual disciplines, which was to look at the practice of fasting and see how it loves my neighbor. What I quickly realized in the course of my studies throughout history is that that was already there all the time. Christians for centuries have cooked the best meals and prepared them with meticulous aesthetics, didn't eat them, and went down the street to, you know, in the city and handed them off to those in need. That was fasting. It wasn't me hiding in my closet praying to God about my next career opportunity. You know, Lord, please help me with this. It was very social. It was very neighborly. And uh, this, this uh, led me to raise the question about all of the other spiritual disciplines that we often talk about, like meditation, silence, and solitude. And what you find in the Christian tradition is there is all, they, they were embedded in a context in which this is how I love my neighbor. Fasting is about eating. I can eat viciously in ways that steal from my neighbor, or I can eat in ways that ignore and disregard my neighbor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fast, and I'm going to prepare a meal to give to my neighbor as an act of love. Meditation. I often, while I'm driving, think of my neighbor in particular ways. Maybe I shouldn't think of my neighbor in those ways because it's training me to think, in my think about my neighbor in those ways. So what if I started meditating on scripture which tells me to love my neighbor and that they're created in God's image and I should love my enemy and these sorts of things. Maybe meditation helps me better think about my neighbor. And so in the course of my studies in, in, in spiritual disciplines, this is what I discovered is that they're all acts of love towards my neighbor. And throughout history, they have been practiced in many different ways, particular to different contexts, so that they can love their neighbor. Um, and so what, what, what that kind of illumined for me is I'm always eating. I'm always thinking. I'm always talking or I'm always not talking. I'm always doing something. And this is when I discovered in the virtue and vice tradition, you're always either living and behaving virtuously or you're always living and behaving viciously. Virtues and vices are not things we add on to our lives. They're stuff we're already doing. The question is, are we doing them virtuously or are we doing them viciously? The, these practices and habits aren't things we're adding on. They're not extracurricular to our lifestyle. You're either thinking viciously about your neighbor, which might, which might involve ignoring them, or not trying to love them, or you're thinking virtuously about them, or you're either eating viciously or virtuously, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so Leslie Newbegin, who's a missiologist, uh, who I think is one of the best missiologists ever in the modern, uh, in the modern era, who had a, had a philosophical bent to him and thought philosophically, um, was uh, greatly influenced by a, a philosopher by the name of Michael Polanyi. You probably, you know, you're familiar with Polanyi, who was himself an epistemologist. So an epistemolo epistemology is philosophy of knowledge. How do you know things? How do you come to know anything? And there's a lot of richness in that whole tradition and, and in uh, the epistemological, but I'm not going to go down to it down that rabbit hole. But one of the things that Polanyi discovered was, and began to assert, that's consistent with what you just said, 
He said epistemologically, the way that you know things, there is no epistemological Switzerland. There's no neutral ground. You don't not hold views. You're either holding things for or against. You're either believing something or you're not believing. You're either understanding or you're ignorant. There's no middle space where things are neutral until you either grow in intelligence or you grow in ignorance. You're either one or the other. And the virtue tradition is the same way. You're either, you're either growing towards your perfection and excellence, nurturing things, engaging in the disciplines, or you're being haphazard about it, not being reflective, doing things that are habit-forming without thinking about it, kind of hoping for the best, you know, that it'll come out okay. And at the end of the day, you got a pile of something that doesn't resemble virtue. Mm -hmm. And so to think in that category, to, to realize I'm either moving towards perfection or I'm moving towards um, destruction is a sobering reality. It, it changes the equation. This is what's, uh, well, not tremendous, terrifying, and what sucks about being a Christian. Yeah. I mean, I, I think every time I hear the verse, taking every thought captive, yeah. if that doesn't put you on your heels right. and, um, you know, make you acutely aware of yourself as a sinner, I don't know what would. Right. Uh, but that is the Christian life, to take every thought captive. Mm hmm which meditation, you know, remedies and works against, but it's also taking every practice and every habit. Why am I doing this? Right. Should I be doing it this way? Right. Am I loving myself, my neighbor? Am I honoring God? I mean, to do that all the time uh, and everything that you do is not just enervating but exhausting. Yep. And it's, it's humbling. But, but I think that's the call of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the Christian life is an incredibly consequential life. It, it's, not, it's not devoid of meaning, for sure. But it's not a light thing. It's not light duty. Mm -hmm. to, to be a Christian and to walk in holiness and to grow in our formation is heavy laden with consequence and significance so that's why the Apostle Paul, and then C.S. Lewis picks up on this, about when he talks about the eternal weight of glory. To be a Christian is not to be light. I, I talked about this last summer with the Light Princess, um, which we put out through our uh, Scattered Seas newsletter. If you haven't read George MacDonald's The Light Princess, you know what to do this afternoon. It's <laughs> phenomenal. Uh, you can listen to an audio recording of it, which uh, we listen to. It's it's beautiful. Anyhow, um, the, the light princess, she's not attached to the earth. She's not embodied. And she continues, she's always laughing and always floating away. She's not tethered to the ground. She doesn't have an eternal weight of glory. And it's not an eternal weight of glory that we are just waiting for when we translate into new life through death. The eternal weight of glory starts now. As C.S. Lewis said, you've never seen an ordinary person before. Right? In, in that sermon, The Weight of Glory, you've never seen an ordinary person. You're either seen someone who is making their way towards glory, and if that glory was revealed, you would be tempted to bow down and worship because of how glorious it is. Or they are making their way towards vice and destruction and ugliness that is beyond comprehension in words. Mm -hmm. So the Christian life is, is freighted with glorious purpose. And, he, and consequence, and you're either moving towards glory or away from it. And so there is no inconsequential decision. Mm -hmm. As we like to say here, every decision is a stewardship decision. Every decision that we make is a stewardship decision. Mm -hmm. God, has, God has created things. He's given us gifts, talents, resources, opportunities, relationships. And when we ha we have, we've been charged with responsibility to engage in those things, responsibly, mm -hmm. either being moved towards glory or away from it, towards virtue or away, uh, away from it. Mm -hmm. So things like, what is a body for? How do I use my hands? The way in which I, I do this, 
or I do <laughs> the way in which I, I use my hands or, you know, gestures that I can't use here uh, in <laughs> the class driving. while I'm driving. Right. Yeah. So you, the way your embodiment, there's nothing inconsequential just about your hands. Mm -hmm. It's either moving you towards glory or away from it. Mm -hmm. Learning how to play a violin is m perfecting you towards your glory. Mm -hmm. Learning how to caress a child. I'm, did you remember when you had to learn how to swaddle your baby? Yes, I failed at that you failed for years. <laughs> There's this whole, you know, up and over. And That's not an insignificant thing. That's not an inconsequential activity to learn. It's nurturing a child, which is in turn shaping who you are. Learning how to turn a wrench and how to tighten a nut properly and not cross thread and rip, the, you know, rip it to shreds is not an inconsequential thing. It's, a ver it's, an, it's an excellence. It is nurturing your soul. You're, it's not just an instrumental thing where you're trying to fix your refrigerator like I was this weekend and I cut my thumb. Learning how to do that well is a, is a, soul, a soul endeavor. Yeah. And I, I think um, sometimes, I think one misunderstanding of the virtue and vice tradition is at least theologically or from a Christian perspective, it's easy to get into works righteousness thinking. Yep. Right. Um, as, as we discuss this, it's easy for our heads to shift to, um, you know, are you just insinuating that we have more to do in order to be a good Christian? Right. Um, no, but, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, Christ is a prism that sheds light on all of the, all of the ways in which we are self-centered and selfish. And why wouldn't you want to abide in him and work against those, those uh, dimensions and those in that behavior mm -hmm. in order to glorify him, in order to follow him. So it's not a question of salvation right. um, or, or working towards who you should be, but in, in, I think in abiding in Christ, you will come to care about rectifying right. those ways of thinking and, and acting and doing. And a lot of this is informing your thinking right now to plug not your just your book but our school as we're developing the school a lot of this is informing your the pedagogy the way in which we're teaching yeah. here at Beverly Heights Church a, a desk means something yes. yep. versus a table mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how you've thought about that as a as a form of excellence yeah um yeah um so I've thought a lot about Christian education and what that looks like and, um, you know, instilling a Christian worldview into our kids. But more and more recently, I'm, my, my mind is taken to uh, the classroom, the environment, and what you might call the pedagogical techniques, how the teacher interacts with the students that I would like to see a lot more Christian character and demonstration. You, you know, you could be teaching the Bible to someone and yet, um, you know, disregard uh, a five-year-old's question and say that's a stupid question. Not that any uh, teacher here would ever do that. Never. But, but yeah. <laughs> um, but I have, seen, I have seen that. Or get angry and yet you're, you're reading a passage, uh, you know, from, from Galatians about the fruits of the Spirit, you know. How we set up the classroom, how the environment that we cultivate is shaping their Christian imagination and how they understand Christ. Mm -hmm. Not just what we say, um, or not just our lifestyle, but how we interact with them. Right. How we field their questions. What consumes most of our day. You know, like I think... One aspect of the Christian life that's really, really important, and it's one of our essentials here, fellowship, there needs to be time during the school day for kids to cultivate Christian friendship. Friendship just doesn't fall from the sky. Right. And I think a good Christian educator is going to create space for kids to cultivate friendship. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be important for their discipleship mm -hmm. and and. and, and their ability to learn in the classroom and their enjoyment of learning in the classroom. So while there, you know, many other institutions are, you know, rushing you through all of the curriculum, which is only the books, mm -hmm. I think the curriculum also involves how we set up the classroom, mm -hmm. how we use our time, 
creating space for them to have fellowship, um, how we interact with them in asking, in fielding questions or asking about their lives. Mm -hmm. How's everything at home? How are your parents? Um, you know, what was the highlight of your weekend? Those things aren't superfluous. That's being a Christian, mm -hmm. and that's training and raising up Christians. So if there's consequence for how a church building a school will set up and frame a classroom, that same importance translates to the home. Mm -hmm. the, way in which we, the way in which we prepare our homes matters. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we haven't thought about that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, I've came, I came across a um, term of art recently in the book. Uh, is Tom still here? Did he leave? Did he leave? Yeah. So, choir. Yeah. So, he turned me on to a book called How the Irish Saved Civilization. Anybody ever read it? It's true, and it's a great book. And uh, I'm, uh, anyhow, there was a, uh, a term in that book called heroic hospitality. One of the ways in which the Irish saved civilization was through heroic hospitality. And they never turned anybody away. They, when they came to the monasteries after the fall of the Roman Empire in, um, in Ireland, you were always welcome, and a meal was put in front of you. That's shaped the way that I think about our church and my house. Mm -hmm. Like I want to have stuff in my refrigerator in order that I might be hospitable mm -hmm. to our, towards others. Not so that I can just feed myself, mm -hmm. but I always want to be ready to welcome somebody into my house. We have, a, we have a, um, a, a table in my dining room which has a couple of leaf inserts. And when we put the leaves in, it makes the dining room small, and I always get frustrated because of how small it is. But we've been inviting folks, uh, our, our, intern, uh, our, our interns, to our house for dinner uh, every Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I always want to take out the leaf, but having the leaf in the table has begun to shape me in a particular way to be ready for those guys who are coming to the house to eat on Thursday to be able to serve them. So the way in which we just, the way in which we organize our home do we have spaces for people to sit down? My grandmother, I, the Irish saved civilization, but the Italians disciplined it. That's, <laughs> that's how they, uh, yeah. My grandmother was Italian, uh, great-grandmother, off-the-boat Italian. And when I grew up as a kid, my grandmother had a living room. <clears throat> you couldn't sit in it. Everything was plastic. Plastic on the sofa. We called it the velvet rope room because it, it was, you know, basically had velvet ropes. You, couldn't, you could look at it from the hallway, but you couldn't go in it. That, as a kid, I mean, I learned something, yep. right? Mm -hmm. You don't go in that space. Mm -hmm. That's not for you. You're not welcome. Mm -hmm. the, way in which we, the way in which we organize our own homes can shape us mm -hmm. and can shape the world. And so to think about these things, it's consequential. There's mm -hmm. no consequence-free, mm -hmm. morally neutral place or space. Even our homes have virtuous or vicious capacity. Mm -hmm. And so it's incumbent upon the Christian to ask, is my home a home that is conducive to virtue or is it vicious? Is it a total pigsty? So if someone pops in, I say, I'm sorry, I can't let you in. Mm -hmm. Or is the hard work and discipline being engaged in so that... Um, so that you can invite people in. Or on the other side, say the home isn't put together. Do you have the virtues of grace and mm -hmm. uh, of understanding and patience to recognize, hey, we all, we all live in the world and things, you know, sometimes the laundry doesn't get put away until the weekend. Yeah. And do we, have those, do we have those virtues? Let me move us on to this next thing. We need, a better, we need to better understand and translate the virtues. We need a theological grammar informed by a philosophical logic and a philosophical grammar. <laughs> Some mouthful. <laughs> you and I put this together. Yeah. We were talking about it. I love the idea, but I don't think we have time to get yeah, into no, it here. Fine. But I, basically, it's, think, it's, it's talking about thinking about this in a particular way. We can't just... There's certain assumptions we can't make about the virtues. Yeah. And, and as a Christian, we have to think theologically, but we also have to think in different ways as well. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's this succinct. I think, like, um, for those who like to talk about holiness, there's a lot of rich, um, there's a lot of richness to talking about virtue, leaning into who you were designed to be, 
which is to be a creature in Christ, which translates to that is holiness, mm -hmm. you know. So my point simply is I think sometimes we have such great, rich theological grammar and terms that we use that need to be translated uh, in and through, could be translated in and through the virtue and vice tradition mm -hmm. um, that could give us better language and categories for articulating to the world and witnessing to the world what we really mean by these things. Right. So if we start to adopt righteousness, not just as a salvation, a soteriology, that Christ died in order that I might be saved, but, which is true, right. it, that's a true thing, but that righteousness has a moral dimension, as I shared it's in, in this book, and biblically righteousness plays on your position, being positionally righteous in, in the presence of a holy God in which you're un, unholy, but it also has a moral dimension with how we live our life, and so when you start to read the Bible and you see words like righteousness, you, you can start to think about things in two ways. Does this have to do with my salvation? Well, yes, it, it does. Mm -hmm. But it also has to do with the kind of life I'm living now mm -hmm. and whether or not it is nurturing me more towds my perfection or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and then maybe we'll open up for a few questions. Uh, they are practices of love and acts of obedience. The virtues are practices of love and acts of obedience. Being a good person isn't the reason to pursue virtue. Neither is duty, usefulness, or pleasure. It's about love and obedience. Virtuously living is obedient living. You and I were talking about how piety or duty is not enough. That does not get you to Irenaeus, mm -hmm. the, the, the glory of God being fully alive. Nobody will... Nobody will transform by duty to the fullness of what they're sp supposed to be. There has to be something stronger, more powerful at work that pushes us towards our perfection, nurtures us mm -hmm. towards our perfection, and that's love. Mm -hmm. Duty is duty's good, but it's not sufficient yeah. on its own. But yeah, that's right. It's insufficient, and it doesn't get to the heart of the matter, really, um, that you desire to be a virtuous person because of its impact on others. Right. So it's just not, it's not about you excelling just to excel and, and you know, you might become a virtuous person and everybody's like, oh, you're such a great person. We love being around you. Um, it, it's, not, it's not really about you. It's about you being the creature and person that God has created you to be, which involves being virtuous. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you just do it out of duty or pleasure or utility because that's, you know, what you need to do, right. you're not really getting at the heart of the matter, which is this is who God created me to be, mm -hmm. and I want to live into and lean into that. Right. So lovers make the most virtuous people. If you want to be virtuous, you have to be a lover. Mm -hmm. And love itself is a virtue. It's a skill that has to be practiced and nurtured and... and, and um, developed in one's life so that you know how to love correctly. And love is like that Switzerland situation. It's, it's no neutral space. You're either loving good things or loving the wrong things. Yeah. You're, you're made to be a lover. And so you cannot be too careful about what you cast your gaze upon, mm -hmm. what you give your heart to. Because you're going to give your heart away. Yep. That's, that's, a, that's a foregone conclusion. You will give your heart away. Mm -hmm. Will you give it to things that will nurture you towards virtue and perfection, or will you give it to things that will enervate and weaken your life? Amen. Yeah, God wants us to be lovers, lovers of him. That's why he has, he has love God, then your neighbor like yourself. Mm -hmm. That's the order of love. Mm -hmm. Love God, then neighbor, then self. And when we have that rightly ordered, we, we're the right kind of lover mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll be nurtured toward our perfection. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, thanks for letting us nerd out with you guys uh, and between us. But we've got a couple minutes uh, before, we have to, before we have to close. Let's nerd out together. What do you guys want to talk about with any of what we've talked about in the weeks leading to today or this Sunday? Any questions or comments or conversations about virtue and vice? Yes. Um, I really enjoyed this very much. Um, the, the, there's a verse that... I was reminded of while you were speaking, um, you were talking about original intent, what God created man to be originally, 
And as as, what is a body for question. Exactly. In the garden, as humans, Adam and Eve had the glory of God and were told to spread the glory of God. They were to recreate and cover the earth with glory. Before they fell, they enjoyed being loved and they were able to love without selfishness. When they fell, they spiritually died and they lost that capacity to, to, to receive God's love to spread his glory because selfishness, if your motivation is selfishness, you're not able to be selfless. Now, what Jesus, that, there's a verse that says he came to seek and save. In Greek, it's that which was lost, not those who were lost. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I had heard that, and I thought it was who was lost. He saved the lost. We're the lost. It's in Greek, it's that which was lost in the garden. Mm -hmm. What we were originally intended to be was to reflect the glory of God and to love selflessly. Yeah. And without redemption, without the Holy Spirit, we're not able to. But the goal of salvation, the goal is to become more like Christ and to be selfless. Mm -hmm. right. So I loved what you guys were saying. I think it's really Yeah, to be, to, the, 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 the um, Christological project, if you will, uh, what the purpose of Christ was, was not just to set us free, but then to give us a form. Christ is the form. And what was the form of Christ? Deny himself, take up his cross, follow the, the purposes of the Father out of love. I love the Father and the Father loves me. And if you want to know what, you want to know what life is all about, if, if, if the world is asking all the most uh, fundamental questions, what is, the, what is the point of life? That's it. It's to, it's to love God and neighbor and then self. Um, and to grow in, into our perfection, to become who God has called us to be. And, and again, to go back to the virtue tradition, and I think the reason the virtue tradition is important is the virtue tradition reminds us that that's not the work of the Holy Spirit, at least not alone. You don't receive Christ and then you say, all right, virtue, come and fill me. You know, there's work to be done. We're, we're, we're made to be workers, the, the garden is not just an agricultural project as much as it is a moral project. Mm -hmm. the, the garden was created so that men and women could work it mm -hmm. to become who they were supposed to become and to bring glory to God. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't, even though the, 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 um, the, the, the weeds and the thistles didn't come up until after the curse, that didn't mean there wasn't work to do. There was mm -hmm. harvesting and development and glorifying and beautifying. It all needed to be done. Go ahead, Kate. Um, this, is, this all kind of helps make a few things make sense to me, but there's that verse that if you love me, obey me. And the idea, I, I think, it kind of, um, there was a bit of a linguistic change in the last 100 years in English of the idea of belief. It became more like faith, trust, and like the whole pixie dust, like the Disney idea of belief. Like, I just believe it, it happens. But in Christianity before that there was an idea that belief went hand in hand with obedience. Like to believe is to obey. And I'm not saying that obedience is what saves you, but when you become more Christ-like, the more Christ-like you are, the more obedience that you are doing in your life. And the virtue tradition, I think, because um, in our family we have a, a Catholic, Protestant kind of schism. It's like, oh, well, the virtues are like, that's, that's in a different realm, but it, it isn't really. It just has kind of been co-opted by a certain tradition, and I kind of love that we're bringing it back to Christianity as a whole rather than just the church Catholic on the one side of the schism. Yeah, I would, I, I would affirm that. I mean, I think for many believers, faith is something up here when in reality it's cardia. It's, it's your gut, and your gut is in your body. And it's very embodied. And, you know, this is why for a large part of the tradition, for Christians to believe, to really believe would be to become a martyr. That's the greatest witness you can show the world is that you would lay down your life for something. Um, and truth be told, there's probably many other worldviews and philosophies in the world who are far more far more um, inclined to, to lay their lives down than Attuned we are yeah. for, mm -hmm. for our faith. Yep. I got to get upstairs.
Kyle, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate it. Thanks for the conversation. I'm going to have Kyle close us in prayer, and I'm going to scooch upstairs, and we'll do it again next week. Next week, we're going to actually get to the seven virtues and uh, talk about them, and we'll bring this all to a close. So thank you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this time that we can ponder your word, ponder your created order, uh, who you have called us to be, what it means to find our lives in Christ, to follow you, Jesus, to give our lives to you as acts of worship and obedience. We ask that you would continue to prompt our hearts and consciences and uh, send us your Holy Spirit to empower us and to guide us in leaning into life in you. We ask that you would give us your grace to love ourselves when we know we fail and to love our neighbor when they fail and hurt us. God, may we always honor and glorify you and may we love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.